And now our next guest is one whose current projects range from growing human organs to resurrecting the woolly mammoth. Harvard genetics professor George Church is at the cutting edge of genetic experimentation. He helped develop the first method for sequencing a genome and the gene editing tool CRISPR. Our Walter Isaacson sat down with him to discuss this transformative technology and to address the ethical issues in genetic engineering. They also discussed the controversy around his connection with the convicted sex offender, the late Jeffrey Epstein. George Church is known to have had multiple meetings and calls with Epstein and received research funding from him. He's publicly apologized for those contacts. George Church, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. You have a paper coming out on age reversal in mice. Right. How do you do that? And by the way, you're going to get it done <laughs> before we have to get too old? Well, before, yeah. So, so it is aimed at uh, after mice. We're already starting clinical trials in dogs. And then after that will be clinical trials in humans. And it's, it's on a very fast track. It's a gene therapy. The way it works is gene therapy. And uh, it's a combination. So we have combination drugs for cancer and infectious disease, but not so much for other things. So this is this will be interesting. And because there are like nine pathways of aging, they're fairly w well accepted. Uh, things like telomere and cal calorie restriction and some of the sort of things that people have heard of. And uh, we want to hit all nine pathways at once. And we, so we want to deal with diseases of aging and uh, the fun via the phenomenon of aging. And we want reversal rather than longevity because, you know, like some mammals, like the bowhead whale lives 200 years. If I went to the FDA and said, I got some pills here that will make you live 200 years, they'll say, great, come back in 120 years <laughs> in the clinical trial, you know? Give me an example of a reversal. What does that mean? Many of the proteins, that, the, the enzymes and other things in your body that are helping you repair and um, respond uh, are dropping with age mm -hmm. because you don't really need, don't need them anymore. And so we're just boosting them back up. Do you see any ethical, moral issues about trying to reverse aging? I usually see some ethical, safety, moral issues on every new technology, especially the technologies that we deal with are, are mm -hmm. usually quite transformative. The, the ones that come up here are um, population, um, uh, our population is decreasing its rate of increase. Uh, and in fact, in cities, it's, it's it going down. It's, it's like at uh, 1.2 children per family, which is below the replacement rate. Uh, there's issues of, um, you know, are we truly reversing aging so that we think younger thoughts and, and we're not stuck in our ways and we're not like just sitting on a big pile of money and not letting anybody else have a chance I think these are things that where the problem isn't the aging reversal. The problem is various other things in society, and we need to address those. So at one point, when you're doing genetics, oh. you decide, I want to help bring back the woolly mammoth. Right. I want to regenerate some species that have right. gone extinct. Yeah. And now it's continuing to happen. You're still involved. Tell me about bringing back the woolly mammoth. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a very popular topic. It, it, it's a fairly small fraction of what we do, but it is very exciting. Uh, I just uh, returned from Siberia, uh, where we uh, collect, I, I personally got to dissect uh, six frozen um, mammoths. They were, some of them were 40,000 years old. And we, and we brought them back. We used a new technology for reading them. So the thing that's interesting here, there are two things. Is one is that we can read that ancient DNA. In fact, we can read ancient DNA that's up to 700,000 years old. Um, Furthermore, that we, we can read it into the computer, we can figure out what the ancient genome, we can reconstruct the ancient genome, and then we can decide which genes are likely to achieve whatever it is we want to do. So we're really, we're really resurrecting genes, not species. And we're putting them into a species that, that needs help and can help us. So, so the Asian elephant is an endangered species, and uh, it is very closely related to the mammoth. They're almost they're so similar in sequence. They're closer to each other than they are to the African elephant. So we can help them by providing them a new place to live. And they return the favor by um, in, uh, keeping the, the Arctic cold um, and hence keeping the carbon there trapped. And the carbon there trapped is way more carbon than, 
than we're worrying about in the atmosphere or in the, even in the, in the rest of the world's forests. So you think there would be an impact on climate change? We're working with the Zimoff family, uh, who's established two parks, Pleistocene parks. One is in very northern Siberia and one's near Moscow. And they're trying, to, and they've shown that, that if you bring herbivores, they can maintain the, the more ancient grassland, which is far better at sequestering carbon. It's better at uh, reflecting sunlight than these black uh, trees uh, are. And, um, and, the, and the, they allow the herbivores to stomp down the snow, so you get a conduction of the minus 40 winds rather than this fluffy snow blanket which protects the summer soil temperature from the, from the low temperatures above. So all of those things can be mitigated if you shift back from trees to grass. Now normally I'm a big fan of trees, but in this particular <laughs> case it was, a, it was not what humans want anyway, and it was not what the animals wanted back then. So the elephants are the few herbivores that can actually knock down trees. They can knock them down in 15 seconds. They love doing it. So you think we may, 20, 30 years from now, have woolly mammoths roaming the Arctic again? So I don't know the exact time frame. We're trying to accelerate it. Many of the, thing, many of the technologies I've worked on have arrived ahead of schedule, like the affordable sequencing was supposed to take six decades. It took six years. So I'm, I don't know. It could, <laughs> I could be wrong in either direction if I... Predicted, but yes, the hope the hope is that we will have uh, large herds of them if that's what society wants. What other extinct uh, species would you bring back if you could? You know, there's not a close second for me personally, but uh, I'm part of a team that has a website, uh, Revive and Restore, where they list about a hundred different species, and there are some very ardent uh, champions of each of these. But I think the the woolly just really has it all in terms of. People like big things. It's not a carnivore. It's an herbivore. Knocks down trees. It's saving the environment. It just has so many things going for it in addition to its charisma. But this is just my personal opinion. I, I, I could <laughs> present arguments for some of the other species. Well, you made a little bit of news about 10 years ago when you kind of said, hey, maybe we should bring back the Neanderthal. <laughs> and you even said maybe we should have, you know, a surrogate mother would volunteer yeah, to yeah. give birth to a Neanderthal. Yeah. There, there, there weren't any shoulds in my, my mm -hmm. say. This is the problem. When scientists are asked whether you can or not, they'll, they'll say, technically, you can do it. And so I was asked multiple times by multiple journalists. And I, I try not to dodge the questions. I try to, uh, and, and I said, yeah, that's technically possible. This is what it would be. And, uh, and uh, I said, but we're not doing it, right? You know, uh, it, there's, no, there's not any compelling reasons. Uh, you know, I, I think there are even fewer compelling reasons for the Inethol than there are for the Dodo, and it's so ethically fraught. Um, you know, we, we'd have to develop the technology for cloning humans, and you have to get IRB approval for, for every step of the way. And it's just not, who's it benefiting? You recently got caught up in this Jeffrey Epstein affair where he was donating money to Harvard and other places, and you recently apologized for it. What did you learn from that, and do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a great tendency to, uh, for people to distance themselves mm -hmm. rather than apologizing and worrying about the victims. I mean, I think the conversation really should be about um, how we can avoid this in the future and how we can um, just uh, uh, face. But the first step is facing uh, what we've done wrong. And I, I, think that, uh, you know, I think that my role was small, but it doesn't mean that I can just distance myself from it. You helped develop the technology for the human genome sequencing. Yeah. And what you really did is you pushed down the price. You made yeah. sure it got cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. Now it's almost less than $300 to get my genome sequence. Right. Should I do it? Should our viewers do it? And why? Well, the should is, you know, the should is in order to do what, right? You know, and I think that if you're if we really, as a society, um, it's a public health threat mm -hmm. that isn't easily understood by the public. It's like seat belts. You know, you had, you had a 1% lifetime risk of, of dying or getting seriously hurt if you don't buckle up. But if I got my genome sequence, couldn't I figure out a lot more than just major genetic diseases? Like, couldn't I figure out you, propensities to cancer, propensities to yes. diabetes? You know, I think it's, it's up to the individual whether they want to learn more. I mean, I'm very curious, so I wanted to see my whole genome. Um, but, you know, I think it's a conversation you need to have uh, with whoever's providing the service in your 
personal physician. Um, but at a minimum, you should be doing the very highly actionable things and making sure that the next generation is not burdened with serious uh, genetic diseases. What are the things uh, advancing in terms of cancer oh. treatments that uh, excite you the most? Well, cancer is entering a whole new phase now with things like CAR T therapies. This is chimeric antigen receptor on T cells where you can train a T cell or you can program a T cell with molecular biology to attack a particular cancer if that cancer has a particular protein on the surface that, you, that is characteristic of that cell type or that cancer. And those cell types are immune cells in our body, right? Well, the, the attacking cell is immune. The yeah. target doesn't have to be immune. It can be, mm -hmm. in principle, any, any cancer. So far, it's been the first target were another, other immune cells that were cancerous. And you can consider that a precision or personalized medicine, but it's not in the classical sense where we, we you know, study the cancer oncogenes, the things that are causing the cancer, and target those with, with small molecule drugs. This is more like we pick anything on the surface that has nothing to do with the cancer cell. We're just killing all B cells. And also, we're getting better at prevention. So the, the genes that cause cancer are something that could be avoided much, much earlier in life before you actually get the disease. So Angelina Jolie was, mm -hmm. I thought, was something that was going to be such a moving experience that everybody was going to go out there to get their genome sequence because she did not have cancer. She did not have any shred of you know, positive mammogram or lump or anything. She had a genetic risk factor, which you, you could only get by looking at your genome. Um, we need more of that. So those are the two main things, I think, the, the CAR T's and, the, and the, the, the getting your genome sequenced to see it to, so you can avoid cancer by preventative measures. Not, mm -hmm. Because once it starts growing, you're kind of fighting this losing Darwinian battle. When we edit human genes and do it in the germline, which means it goes on to our children and our descendants. Yeah. Do you think that should only be done for therapies, like to fix things such as Huntington's disease? Or do you think it would be a good idea to make our children taller and blonder and stronger? I just want to clarify, we don't, we don't do this right now. We don't yeah. edit uh, genes in germline. There are alternatives. And you always have to consider the alternatives in medicine, right? So. The alternatives uh, for Huntington's, uh, which is practiced, is that you can go into an IVF clinic mm -hmm. and you can pick the embryos that don't have uh, Huntington's. And you can even do that in such a way that you don't even let the parents know whether they have it or not. Some parents don't want to know whether they have Huntington's. They just want to make sure their kids don't. And so that's all, that's all done. So there's no particular motivation to d develop a new technology. All these new therapies, they cost a billion dollars to develop a new therapy, whether it's gene therapy or some regular small molecule, I, I prefer things that are equitably distributed. I mean, this is, this is, when you talk about ethics, I think this is something that should come up more than it does. Is, is, uh, it's not just is it safe and effective, but is it going to be uh, available to everybody uh, so you don't have the rich get richer situation um, and the poor get poorer. And the alternative that is very cost effective uh, and available today doesn't require new research particularly, it does require some communication, is um, genetic counseling rather than gene therapy. So you just read your genome, which you kind of have to do anyway to do the therapy. Just read it, and then you can, um, you can pick people that are compatible with you um, before you start dating. Uh, so so this, it's only 5% it's only 5 of the people that you'll miss. So 95% of the mm. people are compatible with you. So it's not a big burden from a dating standpoint. What did you think when the Chinese doctor, though, did this type of editing that was inherited? I mean, it was uh, um, inevitable. I, I, you know, I, and I wasn't uh, necessarily happy with it, the outcome, but I was, I, I was not surprised by it either. Uh, we, did, we had not set up a, an adequate system for uh, whistleblowing. They can't point the finger at just at the person who did it. There was also, there were dozens of people who knew about it, both in the United States and, and in China. Uh, none of them spoke up. We just don't have a culture uh, of whistleblowing, and we should, because there, this, this is not the most serious things that we should be blowing whistles on. I mean, things having to do with pathogens and so forth. You know, it's unlikely that people will die because of this particular experiment, okay? There are two children born so far, 
maybe a third, uh, I think it's unlikely they're going to die, but we'll see. Uh, and I think we should be paying attention to them. There should be some sympathy for their, for their plight. Um, they've at least been spared of the publicity. But, you know, there were deaths at the beginning of gene therapy. Um, gene therapy forged ahead. Um, in this case, I don't, I don't even think we're talking about life and death. We're talking about something much more abstract. You've formed uh, more than 20 companies, I think, oh. coming out of the basic science that comes out of your lab or that you've worked with. Oh. Uh, do you think that's a really good thing for science to be driven by trying to create biotech companies and fund it? Or do you think that that can be a problem as well, which is it drives science to uh, do things that you wouldn't do unless you could make a lot of money out of it? Well, so, I mean, I think you can be driven in that in, in odd ways uh, without ever making a company. I mean, you could, um, and there is a problem that if you, if you just publish something without escorting it into the, uh, into the public where it can be used, um, it, it, it dies. It doesn't, doesn't blossom. So I think there's some, you need some commitment to getting it out there. And, you know, some of these things are quite expensive. You know, the cost of, of developing a drug is a billion dollars. If you're going to try to do that, if you expect somebody to read your paper and somehow it's just going to happen, this is uh, unreasonable. But for the most part, most of my colleagues that I know that do this, uh, they're just totally motivated by the science, the cool factors, uh, the helping society. And what they do with the money is they just plow it right back into research uh, some for either basic research or or more uh, applied research. I don't think it warps uh, our mission that much. George, thank you for being with us. Sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate Lovely. it.